Lee today, uh, now, uh, talking to us in our uh, ECR seminar. Uh, Martha did her undergrads in Siena, then followed by a master in PISA, and then she went to um, Paris Sud for her PhD, and she stayed there as well uh, for her first postdoc working on Planck. Uh, she then switched uh, into uh, SKA, so she went to uh, South Africa to um, University of the Western Cape, uh, started working on um, 21 centimeter um, intensity mapping, uh, and then went to Trieste, and is now uh, a postdoc in Zurich, so working on a 21 centimeter line neutral hydrogen. Uh, she is one of the co-chairs of the Cosmology Science Working Group, and she will tell us more about uh, the SKA uh, Observatory today, which I'm quite excited about. So go ahead. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Maggie. Uh, this is my first uh, Korea seminar, so I'm very happy about that. I uh, hope uh, for the next time I could actually come in person to visit. So let me share my screen. And so what I'm going to discuss today is uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping as a technique for cosmology and uh, how this uh, enters inside the plants of the SKA, what can we do now and how are we preparing for, for the future. So uh, first of all, let me just uh, start from a, a recap of how important hydrogen is in the history of, uh, of uh, the evolution of our universe from, from recombination, uh, where the, 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 the coupling of the CMB, it's really uh, coming from the fact that the hydrogen first formed, uh, and then how uh, the, the dark ages uh, evolved, and then the first stars start to shine, uh, creating the, the first uh, int for the cosmic dawn, and then all the process of realization where hydrogen got completely destroyed and survived only maybe I can put this small, maybe if you prefer. Yeah, here, sorry. Uh, hydrogen survived only in these dense clumps uh, of the Laska structure and participate is the key uh, player in, uh, in the galaxy evolution for, for the late universe. So, what is uh, interesting about uh, hydrogen is that uh, through his 21 centimeter line, we can really try to uh, uh, study a very long arch in the history of the universe, really from the cosmic dawn to realization uh, through all the, also the late universe. And uh, uh, most important uh, for the near future, all uh, this uh, uh, history of the universe can be studied using the SKA. Uh, why is that? It's because the, the, the 21 centimeter line of an emperor legend get redshifted by the expansion of the new universe and go down to radio frequencies. And so if, you, if we manage with one experiment, in, uh, even if it's two uh, separate telescopes to cover all these, uh, these frequency arch, we are really uh, uh, spanning the, the, all the time from the cosmic dawn evolution through down to the post unification universe. So the, the way the SK is going to be divided is this, uh, this the, the, the SK observatory is going to have an SK low part. Uh, targeting the lower frequency and so for 21 centimeter physics the the highest red shift so up uh, in principle even touching uh, the the dark ages before the cosmic dawn and then uh, a part uh, in south africa uh, very different design with this array of dishes instead of uh, of dipoles uh, that uh, is gonna uh, start uh, uh, covering from redshift zero and could go up to redshift three so the the sk meet is is partially already there uh, because if you look carefully in this picture you can recognize that this dish is different from this one and this is because uh, uh, the SK mid is going to be built around it's going to be adding uh, new dishes to uh, the Mirkat telescope that has already 64 antennas there uh, and in principle can help us can can really give us the possibility to go up to redshift 1.5 uh, for studying the, the evolution of hydrogen. Uh, so this, this talk is going to be a bit about simulation and how we are preparing the SKA, uh, but I just also want to briefly show you what is the status of the analysis uh, of cosmological data uh, for, uh, from the Mirka telescope. So first of all, uh, just a bit of motivation why uh, it's interesting uh, to look, uh, especially for the posterization universe at the last case structure with uh, hydrogen and how much information is, uh, is there. Uh, 
so the, the, the idea is really that the baryons, uh, so the, the hydrogen for us is our like door to enter the dark universe. So there are fundamental questions that we are trying to answer uh, with the mapping Velasquez structure uh, of, through uh, the neutral hydrogen. And of course, is the, the, the big uh, uh, open question that we know are uh, in cosmology. So uh, it is the nature of dark matter and dark energy. And so how is this dark matter distributed on large scales and how this distribution evolves with time? And of course, how then uh, dark energy plays a role uh, in that. Uh, but at the same time, since we are actually measuring hydrogen, we have also uh, the need to understand how these two things are connected. So how these variants trace uh, dark matter, so what is the link between galaxy and dark matter halos, how is H1 distributed on this cosmic web to, to grab the, the dark universe information, we really need to understand these, uh, these type of questions. So uh, how we can, why this is so important and how we can actually do that? Uh, so we can do that through this technique that we were mentioning in the title, that is intensity mapping. So the idea uh, is um, to start, uh, so the starting point is that, okay, if I could resolve uh, the, the H1 uh, in galaxies, I could like do a survey very similar to what is done for galaxy, uh, for galaxy survey. So uh, use then uh, the position of H1 galaxy to trace uh, the, the matter clustering. Um, there are two things. This is very difficult to do uh, in H1 uh, because H1 is, uh, is very faint. So it's very difficult to go at a high redshift with that. And also from a cosmological point of view, we don't really need uh, all these details of information on the small scales because uh, especially for large survey, we are really interested in the, in the last case structure of the universe. So uh, the idea of intensity mapping is instead of doing this uh, galaxy survey, which each one galaxy is resolved, um, is to go big. And how we can go big and fast uh, with the, uh, this technique that uh, kind of give up uh, small scale resolution uh, for uh, the fact that we can really span uh, fast a large volume in the sky. So this is kind of a, a, an artistic impression of how these look like, but has a lot of information already. So we are looking really at the structure of, uh, of uh, the, the where hydrogen is distributed on these large scales that are the one that we want to measure. And also uh, it's a, a color coded in a very similar way to CMB. And this is because a lot of the technique that we can use for CMB that has been constructed for CMB, you'll see in the rest of the talk, uh, can actually be used uh, similarly for 21 centimeter intensity mapping. The, the very interesting part in 21 centimeter is that all the, the, the thing we just discussed, that there is a one-to-one -one relation between frequency and, and redshift. So this means that if you can span different frequency, we can actually have a very nice and tomographic view uh, of the universe. So we lose a bit uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, resolution on the pixel, but we're going to have a very high spectral resolution because of this one-to-one -one correspondence. And this, of course, in if we uh, think back about evolution of dark matter, about how dark energy plays a role, give us really a key cosmological probe uh, to do this type, uh, this type of study. So uh, in principle, if we can imagine that we can map uh, without problems, we're going to discuss problems in a second, all the full sky with uh, this hydrogen uh, distribution, we're going to really have uh, a lot of information. And uh, uh, of course, from that, uh, there's a lot of things that can be measured. Uh, you can measure the power spectrum at different redshift. You can uh, measure the PAO signal, and you can measure the, PA, the, the evolution uh, uh, of uh, various cosmological parameters. You can constrain better some of the cosmological parameters and combine uh, 21 centimeter emission with, uh, with other uh, cosmological surveys. So just uh, to give you an idea, I'm going to select uh, just one uh, case, uh, something we did with uh, uh, the PhD student Maria Berti in CISA. Uh, so the idea uh, is that uh, if you want to construct a scale of forecast for 21 centimeter intensity mapping, uh, you need to, uh, to start from how you construct this power spectrum. So the idea is that the 21 centimeter power spectrum is a bias tracer of the matter a power spectrum, so it's going to have a matter's power spectrum here, and then uh, the there's the uh, you have to take into account uh, the the fact that the, uh, there is a bias 
because you are actually measuring each one, and so you are interested in the uh, in the bias uh, of how each one relates to the direct market. And you have also to take into account uh, the fact that uh, you are actually measuring a temperature priceness, so you have to uh, convert. Uh, the fact that you expect that there is uh, mass in each one uh, in the universe to uh, this temperature brightness that you are actually measuring. So you have to do a bit these uh, uh, these uh, different uh, uh, part for the for constructing your uh, power spectrum. Of course, this new here is the fact that uh, uh, there's not. Uh, so you have to take into account uh, that. Um, uh, you, it's not only dependent on K and redshift your power spectrum, and so this uh, you can do what the standard uh, galaxy survey does and and construct uh, your power spectrum multiples. Uh, so here it's not important the details, but just the fact that in principle to describe uh, the full information that you have, uh, you can use multiple uh, various multiples. So of course in general and since uh, also in particular twenty one centimeter intensity mapping is going to become uh, quite noisy uh, soon. We normally use just the monopole uh, and, and, uh, and equal to and the quadrupole. So this is uh, how you can construct some forecast uh, with the board uh, trying to be a bit realistic on uh, the noise you expect, the sky coverage. And I'm just showing uh, these uh, plots just to give you an idea of what can, it can be then the constraining power of this type of information if we measure uh, if you actually measure it uh, from uh, from our uh, scan of the distribution of neutral hydrogen. Uh, so for example, uh, you can uh, like prove the uh, constraining power itself of, uh, of the 21 centimeter intensity mapping power spectrum. And uh, uh, we found that uh, there is a very good constraining power uh, on a lot of cosmological parameter. And of course you can gain if you add more multiples. But the, the most important thing that I want to show you is uh, when you compare uh, when you combine this type of measurement, for example, with Planck, you're uh, gaining a lot of information because it's a completely different uh, probe at a different redshift. So you really improve the quality of your constraint on, on the parameters. And really, we, we found, uh, of course, this forecast, but really an improvement up to a factor two uh, for, uh, for some of the cosmological parameters. So this is the classical triangular plot that I'm sure you're familiar with. And I just wanted to show you how the, the contour can shrink uh, when we combine Planck and um, the, um, the 21 centimeter uh, information. Okay, so all this is very nice and uh, uh, motivates why we want to do this research. But then we have to face the fact that when we try to measure uh, the, the 21 centimeter emission and we look at the sky with our antennas, what we see is actually this. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I'm sure you know, the uh, just uh, the ASLA map uh, rescaled the, the frequency of interest uh, uh, and it's like this uh, synchrotron emission from our galaxy that really dominates uh, the low frequency, the, the radio frequencies. So the, 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 the game is now how uh, then with this, uh, we can arrive to actually measure the 21. With this in front of us, we can actually arrive and measure the 21 centimeter um, uh, emission. So uh, one thing that we could say is like, okay, let's say at least to avoid this uh, very bright emission from the galaxy and restrict ourselves maybe to a part of the sky where there is less emission. But uh, what I want to underline is that there's not only synchrotron, there's not only the galaxies really, complex interplay between uh, different uh, uh, radio emission and, and foregrounds. So there are uh, the galactic, but also the extra galactic coming from uh, the radio sources. And uh, uh, the, the, the story is complicated by the fact that it's not only superposition of various emission from, from, from the radio foreground, uh, but there's also the fact that when you try to interpret your data, uh, these data are taken by telescope that are uh, on, on Earth. So uh, there is a lot of uh, RFI uh, contamination by the fact that even if you are in the middle of a desert, the contribution of the cities around is gonna uh, be uh, problematic for your data. So you have to be careful about uh, uh, what is actually uh, emission from uh, pristine emission from, from the cosmos and what is uh, strange stuff that pass uh, because of uh, cellular uh, phones or uh, also satellites, of course, that uh, uh, continuously uh, pass in front of your, uh, of your telescope. 
And then uh, you are taking measurement with the telescope, so there's a lot of distortion that the telescope can cause, and this need to be taken into account. Um, and then the way you are scanning the sky also change the way the noise is distributed in your maps, so you have to take that also into account. So it's a complex task, uh, but of course uh, it's important to do it. It's uh, well-motivated uh, science cases, and it's quite new. Uh, so, uh, so it's the fact that all this technique uh, need to uh, to be developed uh, now. So it's also very nice that uh, this is uh, kind of the the moment where this type of science is uh, is quite interesting. So. Uh, if we try to use the property of the foreground to understand what we can do uh, with respect to that, so there is a, a really the, the striking uh, property of the fact that this, uh, if you look at the sky, you compute the, the various, uh, of course, with simulations, uh, and you compute the various uh, uh, angular power spectrum of the, the, the different emission that you can have, uh, you'll see that with respect to this black line that is actually the signal, all the foregrounds are uh, much stronger. Uh, order of magnitude stronger uh, than, than the, the, the mission that we want to measure. And in particular, the synchrotron on large scales, as we were seeing before, that is this uh, galaxy uh, in, in synchrotron emission in front of us. Uh, the good news is, however, that we expect this foreground to be quite smooth in frequency. And this is like a, a simple plot, of course, always with simulation, uh, just uh, constructed taking one line of sight across one of these uh, tube constructed with the different uh, uh, the measurement at different frequencies and one uh, taking one just one of sight and the, the difference between how we expect the 21 centimeter emission to fluctuate to be almost noise like as a function of frequency or redshift with respect to the smooth variation of the synchrotron and the free free um, is, uh, is what we can maybe use uh, to, to understand how to, to distinguish these two emissions. So just to recap, there are two things that uh, can summarize what are the properties of the foreground with respect to the signal, is that the foregrounds are order of magnitude stronger, and also that the frequency behavior is quite smooth, so because they are highly correlated along the, the line of sight around frequencies. The question then we want to, to answer is, can these properties of the foreground uh, used to, to really uh, understand how to disentangle these, uh, the signal and the foreground, uh, so can we really uh, then extract our 21 centimeter signal with no problem? And then maybe the question that uh, we are actually uh, trying to answer is, okay, maybe if it's just foreground the signal, yes, I'm going to show you a case. But what if uh, we realistically simulate a full pipeline with all the complication that we were seeing before? So the RFI, the, uh, the effect of the telescope, the effect of uh, inhomogeneous noise and this type of things. So normally the technique that are used uh, for uh, dealing with foregrounds for 21 centimeter emission uh, are different and depend a bit of uh, the type of uh, experiment that depend especially also uh, sometimes with um, uh, the type of redshift that uh, uh, that is um, uh, measured. Uh, in general, for example, uh, the, here I just show like some example, for example, for the cosmic dawn or, or also similar to CMB uh, has also been tried for the post realization universe to use more uh, parametric modeling. Uh, in general, instead for the EOR, uh, we use what is called the avoidance technique, where uh, the properties of the foreground that we were described uh, just uh, just now, uh, especially the fact that they were highly correlated, uh, are used uh, to uh, to hope uh, that there is uh, uh, in this uh, k parallel k perpendicular space, meaning the line of sight and the structure in the sky, uh, a, a, a what is called the clean uh, window for the signal. And this is because uh, if the foreground are really smooth, uh, we really expect that. Them, uh, to uh, pile in a very uh, low uh, band where k uh, uh, parallel uh, is, is very low because of this uh, strong correlation that they have along frequency. What I'm going to discuss uh, mainly today um, is uh, what we use for the post realization universe and for uh, this Mirkat observation that are these uh, separation uh, uh, cleaning technique uh, that are kind of taken also from, from the CMB. Uh, most of, of all these uh, PCA technique the principal component analysis uh, that I'll show you some, some actual results with that. 
So first, uh, before going to the data, uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of how this technique works uh, for simulation. Uh, so just uh, so that we build our confidence of why this technique is so famous and used in 21 centimeter analysis. So uh, here uh, it's a mock observational cube um, where, uh, of course, it's not super realistic, but it's kind of uh, the, the area of the sky that we are measuring now with our cosmological survey uh, for Mirkat, uh, and more or less the number of channels that uh, are kind of saved uh, by the RFI uh, cut here and there. Uh, so let's imagine 100 channels around the redshift 0.5 that is in the middle of the L band, in a way. And then we add all the foregrounds, we have the synchrotron, the free free, the point sources. Uh, we uh, do a simple modeling for the beam, where it's like a nose Gaussian that evolves with frequency, because of course, uh, since the uh, these dishes are looking in the sky, uh, the, the shape of the beam changes lambda over d, where d is the diameter of the of the dish. So uh, at lower frequency, the, the smoothing that I see in my map, of my beam is like larger, so I have more information at high frequency with respect to lower frequency. And then we add uh, some white noise to that. And so the, the, the idea of this uh, uh, blind clean technique is that my data cube, my temperature data cube, can be described as uh, a, a combination of foreground sources, some noise, and my cosmological signal. So one of the tricky points in this uh, equation that seems uh, quite easy is, uh, but then how many sources do I have to use to describe my data. And this is one of the central points of the 21 centimeter analysis. What, uh, if you have heard another talk on that, or if you read some paper, is called N foreground. So the number of components that we think we have to uh, uh, use to describe uh, the, the data cube uh, that is not the cosmological signal. So just to give you really an example of how it works, so let's imagine uh, for our case, uh, we compute, we, we take the, uh, the covariance, the frequency frequency covariance matrix, we compute the game value of the game vector of that, and we plot it here in this, uh, uh, here on the right. So what we see is that the first few, of course, in simulation, the first few modes are really strong, and then uh, everything else looks quite similar. So in a way, we can say, OK, since uh, after three doesn't seem to carry much information, I can just consider the first three modes and hoping that these three first modes describe the foregrounds. So if I reproject these uh, uh, three modes uh, on the data, I can extract uh, my sources, the one that we were saying just before. Uh, and this is the first one we see, this is the second, and this is the third. And uh, uh, just to understand how much this is linked to the, the strong component that I put in my simulation, I just wanted to show you uh, side by side how the first one uh, really looks like synchrotron, how the second one looks like a mixture between uh, free free, this is free free, and here is you see the same pattern for free free, but also these strong point sources that we put in the simulation. These are the point source emissions of uh, synchrotron free free and point source emission, the true one that is in the simulation. And this is what the first three components uh, uh, reconstruct. This also it's quite similar to uh, to the synchrotron, the a mix of free free and the point sources, and, and also some mix of the point sources. So if uh, we subtract then uh, the data to construct just with three sources from the data, what we get is something that really looks like our input signal. So this is our input signal, and this is what we reconstruct. So the cleaning uh, technique uh, for simulation works very well. And so this is why we are uh, hopeful and why we keep using it for um, also for real cases. So but what is actually happening in real cases? So uh, just let me give you an example for this uh, from this paper that uh, Laura Waltz wrote um, with collaborators uh, last year. Uh, so uh, this is uh, regarding GBT data. It's the same thing. It's just one single dish instead uh, of uh, of the of the meerkat uh, uh, or the SK that are still not there dishes. So the, it's really just one dish that looks at the sky to construct this uh, twenty one centimeter map. Um, and uh, if you try uh, uh, to 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 measure this twenty one centimeter signal from from the data, uh, and you keep uh, like uh, cutting away, uh, uh, increasing the number of foregrounds from 4, 8, 20, uh, 36 even uh, modes that you are trying to uh, uh, to take out, uh, still uh, you have this measurement of the power spectrum that is much higher 
with respect to what you you want that here is not even shown but i mean you expect something much lower so what you're measuring here even if you subtract 36 components in the data uh, is uh, residual foregrounds and residual systematics in the data. So here the difference between this and that is just that uh, they're considering the same set of data or two separate set of data cross correlated, but it's still uh, 21 centimeter with 21 centimeter. So there is still uh, there is still a lot of things that we need to do to understand uh, why there's so much systematics in the data because of uh, of this uh, um, how much the, the telescope enter in this uh, in this game. Uh, the good news uh, that I'm gonna first show you for GPT data and then for us too uh, for Mirkat is that there is a way uh, to actually get to a detection and uh, you can suppress uh, the, the the residual systematic and the residual foreground contamination if you cross correlate your signal with the galaxy survey and and uh, so for example here is a nice detection of the cross correlation signal between GPT data and Wiggle Z uh, they, but they also got in this paper the detection for uh, the EBOS galaxy so there is there is a signal and we can take out this signal if we do cross correlation so the reason uh, why cross correlation works so well is uh, uh, summarized in, in this uh, slide that I uh, took from, from from Steve Cunnington uh, when the, uh, the were uh, so here you can see that there is a, um, when you construct uh, when you have two different observable for example you are measuring uh, an optical survey and our uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping when when you use them uh, separately there is the noise. Uh, that in uh, that in autocorrelation uh, cannot go away because it's the same noise. So you have a noise component that you cannot uh, get rid of. And you can see also here, for example, it's a signal plus noise, signals plus noise. But when you do cross-correlation, you expect that the noise or the residual systematics of the optical survey is completely different from the uh, residual systematic of the radio survey. So in cross-correlation, all these terms that contains noise kind of uh, goes away, goes to zero, and so you end up with just the signal. So this is just a very simple explanation of why you expect uh, that cross-correlation is so powerful. Okay, so what do we have now uh, as for our data? So this is Mirkat. This is actually a photo, not a rendering as the one was shown before for the SKA. Uh, so the technique uh, we are using, um, it's for a question of which type of scale we want to measure. We are not actually using the Mirkat array as a full power as an interferometer, but we are doing a sort of trick uh, that is called single dish approach. So instead of having like a GPT one dish looking in the sky, we consider that we are having 64 dishes and we use these 64 dishes uh, at the same time on the same patch to increase the signal to noise. So uh, the idea uh, is uh, uh, the, the scanning strategy is so selecting a patch in the sky and then uh, doing first a track for point sources uh, for uh, uh, resources for uh, for calibration and then a scanning of the sky. And the scanning in the sky is done at constant elevation so that the distance between the ground and, and, and the telescope is always the same so that the, the contribution from the ground speed over doesn't change. And uh, this uh, technique of uh, tracking, scanning and tracking, uh, it's uh, here in this plot here. Uh, and the scanning part is the one that we are actually using then for, uh, for the cosmologic analysis, uh, end up with this strange shape in the sky, uh, depending on if, when you're measuring uh, a patch in a rising or setting. So the, we did on purpose to uh, put the patch in the sky in the same target field of Wiggle Z for the reason we were discussing just before, because it's very difficult to do uh, pure detection of 21 centimeter, but we can uh, do better in cross correlation. So uh, for uh, what we have, this is our observation. This is the first uh, uh, plot coming from this paper by Jin Jin Wang uh, and all the, the Mirklas collaboration. So Mirklas is this uh, uh, cosmology uh, uh, survey on Mirkat for, for uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping. Sorry for a lot of names, but just remember that it's done with the telescope Mirkat. Uh, so as I was saying, this is single dish mode. And uh, as we were discussing just now, the first thing you measure is actually just a synchrotron. As you can recognize here, this diffuse emission very similar and point sources very similar to the maps that we were seeing before. Uh, so we have L-band data, but we also have uh, UHF data that we are analyzing. So this is uh, the first successful calibration. And with this uh, data, 
uh, we have this nice result where it's true that if we try to clean even very aggressively with 30 modes this data, we do not see uh, a detection of the of the 21 centimeter in autocorrelation. But if we do, uh, similar to what GPT has done, the cross correlation uh, with the, the galaxy survey, we actually get a very nice power spectrum, cross correlation power spectrum detection between the galaxy and the H1 uh, with the, that pass a lot of stress tests. And it's actually a seven point sigma detection of this cross correlation power spectrum. So again, uh, we are still working to make the autocorrelation possible, uh, but the fact that there is a signal that we can uh, reconstruct when we do cross correlation is a very good news, meaning that we are really going in the right direction. So um, in all this, this is what we are doing now. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a general uh, vision of what are we doing for, uh, for moving forward for the SKA. So uh, if we are very like sincere with what is the, the possibility up to now, so at the moment we have this 21 centimeter data that are a bit difficult to clean uh, and, and we can have a, a signal in cross correlation. Uh, the, at the other side, we, as I show you, simulation uh, are uh, telling us that we can actually clean the data. So it means that we are still not putting enough realism in the simulation to really uh, make it them uh, much more realistic uh, um, uh, interpretation and realization of the data. And uh, the other thing is that this cleaning method that have worked so well for the CMB that works very well for simulation and never been really stress test on like complete uh, on complex simulation or on complex data. So, so the idea is that for the future, uh, what we are working now on is, of course, to have more and better data, to improve the way we take data, the way we analyze the data, but also to construct more realistic simulation, uh, and of course, to improve uh, the sophistication of the, of the cleaning method uh, on, on this more realistic simulation. Of course, the final aim of all these is we want to measure this 21 centimeter out of our spectrum, so without receding in and the, the, the having to, to, to really use the, uh, the galaxies. And so uh, this detection of a power spectrum cannot come alone and they really need to come with the validation, uh, with the like, careful validation, with the realistic simulation. And uh, uh, really, this is what we are also working on. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna discuss what are we doing from the simulation point of view and the various ingredients and what we are doing for that. I think I still have, yes, I have 15 minutes. So, uh, as always, when we want to construct the simulation, we need to take into account all the various steps uh, that then the actual data pass through. So of course, there will be a part where we have to uh, learn how to simulate the 21 centimeter intensity maps. This is uh, by itself a difficult task, as we were saying, because there's a lot of things that we still don't understand of the relation of a, uh, hydrogen and, and the underlying dark matter. So, so this is uh, per se uh, quite of a difficult task, uh, but uh, then you can do it in various level of complication depending on what is uh, the final aim. Let's say that uh, at the moment we manage to do uh, intensity maps uh, that are quite useful for at least the testing purposes that we have. But of course, also you have to simulate all the foregrounds, the extragalactic one, the galactic one. And then uh, what we are modeling in the data and also trying to, to be a bit more uh, realistic for the simulation. Also, in principle, you have to add the atmosphere and these things that I was discussing before, so the contamination from, from the ground could spill over. Uh, and this is not the end, of course, because you have all the instrumental effect and the RFI. So we are trying really to put these all together. We have some of these pieces that we have we are at, at the good, good status and some other that we need to um, evolve uh, in the, the complexity of simulation a little bit. So uh, first of all, let me just uh, say uh, two words about uh, how we construct these Mach 21 centimeter maps. So we start from uh, studying H1 properties, uh, in particular with uh, what is called a, a um, a semi-analytical model. Uh, this is a work that uh, we have done while I was in Trieste with all the Trieste group, uh, Gabriela De Lucia and collaborators uh, that are the one that wrote this Gaia code. Uh, Gaia uh, has the really, it's interesting for our purposes because it really treats uh, natural hydrogen very well in the way uh, the evolution uh, of the, the various uh, 
physical processes inside galaxy is treated. So what we can do is we can go on the sim take this uh, uh, similar ethical simulation and study the relation between H1 and dark matter in this simulation. The most important thing that we need to study for our purposes is this MH1 M halo relation that you see in this plot here. Uh, and it, it tells you how much hydrogen uh, it's in, uh, uh, in each uh, halo of different mass. And so there are various theories and uh, simulation that have tried to measure that. So our result is here in red, uh, but there are also, you see here various uh, uh, um, people that uh, have uh, similar modeling. So one thing that is uh, uh, important here to see is that uh, um, apart from this is uh, a, a, just a, a problem of the simulation, but theoretically what we expect is a, a certain point they cut off that small halos cannot host H1 uh, and also like a, a behavior at high uh, mass, at the high mass end that is quite uh, power low, uh, apart from uh, at uh, this type, for example, this type of, uh, of modeling here, you have assume that there is a strong AGN uh, feedback that is eating part of the uh, H1 content at the medium range uh, halos. So this type of information can be plugged in in fast uh, halo catalog so that you can reconstruct this full sky map. And this is what you see here. Uh, what we have done, we have uh, combined uh, Pinocchio uh, halo catalog, so this uh, uh, light con created uh, with the uh, uh, Lagrangian perturbation theory with this information on how to paint H1 on halos. And this is how we have created our uh, temperature maps uh, for the H1. Another part that is important is the foregrounds. Uh, typically, what we do is we uh, go back on what Planck has measured and uh, try to rescale at the frequency of interest uh, what, uh, what we have from Planck. So for example, normally we use the, uh, the uh, reprocessed Aslan map by Ramazay et al. Uh, and we have a spectral index uh, to actually scale this Aslan map uh, at all the frequency of interest. Then we have point sources simulated in various ways, free free maps also computed from, uh, from uh, the, what the, the work that has been done for Planck. Uh, so this is normally the typical modeling for, uh, uh, for, the, for the foregrounds. Of course, uh, you can uh, also do other stuff, but this is kind of what the community in general is, uh, is using. And then you have to plug in all the uh, instrumental effects. Here, uh, just let me go through this. So this one in the middle you have seen already, and this is coming from the fact that uh, we are observing the sky with Mirkat in a certain way. And so when we are doing that, we should take this into account in the simulation. And because this uh, uh, scanning strategy enters in the simulation as non homogeneous noise, and in principle, you could also uh, try to be very realistic uh, on how you're looking at the sky and really take into account the direction at which you have, uh, from which you have arrived and where you you've been next. And one of the main point of this, uh, how, why we should really simulate the scanning strategy is because the shape of the beam for Mirkat is not trivial. And here you can see this in this first plot here, where uh, in the simulation I showed you before, we were really looking at a very nice, smooth, a smooth uh, Gaussian. So this, this black line here, but actually the, the, the beam, uh, so the, 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 the telescope beam of Mirkat has these side lobes. So all uh, this, uh, this cerebral structure, this side lobe structure evolves with, the, with frequency and also it's a bit asymmetric. So these things uh, may uh, be very important to, uh, to take into account and we really need to do simulation that takes this into account. And of course, as I was saying before, all the contamination for, from RFI, this is how much RFI is in the band that we are measuring with Mirkat. So this is just another example of how we are trying to put the, the beam inside these side drops that I was discussing just now, uh, that will be a problem also for the SKA because it's a very similar structure. And so we have tried to play a bit with that and uh, put the, the, the realistic beam into the simulation. And we got uh, a bit of uh, uh, kind of uh, frightening results that uh, hopefully that uh, we, we found some technique to mitigate, but just I wanna give you the the possible bad news. The possible bad news is that these uh, side drop structure and the way how the side drop structure change 
with frequency uh, can uh, compromise the way we clean uh, our data with this PCA, for example, that we were discussing before. And depending on how much stronger the foreground uh, can cause some residual peaks in the data. So this uh, is the power spectrum just computed on the line of sight. So the red one is what I want to reconstruct. And all this blue one, depending on how much foregrounds, number of components of foreground I remove, these three, four, or five, I get a peak uh, that corresponds to uh, the oscillation, this, this strange oscillation that we see in the way these uh, side lobe structure evolve with frequency with meerkat. So uh, this is the bad news. The good news is that we, we are working, we, we have found some technique to mitigate that. But this is just an example uh, to say how much uh, we still have to work and understand carefully what is this telescope doing, because it's a new technique uh, using it uh, with Mirkat doing this type of techniques. So everything needs to be checked carefully. Uh, so one thing that we also did is this uh, foreground subtraction challenge. So we tried to put all this complexity that we uh, uh, managed to put in the simulation, construct a very realistic uh, data cube, and give this data cube to the people that normally apply this uh, uh, blind foreground technique, uh, blind foreground subtraction techniques. And so the idea was really, if I give you this data now, would uh, really your method be careful, be, be capable of, uh, of extracting the signal? So this is what's really, we did it blind, so meaning, meaning that uh, uh, the people who um, who dealt with the construction of the simulation were not the people that were actually doing the cleaning. And then the analysis has been done uh, before revealing uh, which method was, uh, who, which method what was so we did like some uh, double blinding procedure. So it was uh, quite interesting, and and really the idea was let's try to discover the the weaknesses and the strength of the various methods because various methods. So I, I mostly talked about PCA, but uh, uh, fast ICA and KPCA and uh, GMCA they all uh, use slightly different properties, statistical property of the data. And so in principle, you want to see differences in that. And indeed, uh, this is, for example, uh, an example of what we found uh, as uh, a result. So here, uh, the, the question, of course, what we wanted to see, to, to see is like how much, the question that we were asking at the beginning, so how much if instead of like a, a, a very nice simulation, I do, I try to put uh, instrumental, uh, how the, in the instrument and the foreground uh, uh, couples together and complicates my, my cleaning procedure. Uh, and of course, the other thing that we want to do is try to understand how we could parameterize the goodness of cleaning in a way. Uh, and so we had this uh, uh, technique applied for all the, the various uh, participants in the various technique. And this is just an example that I wanted to show you. So if uh, everything was working well, these plots uh, would be all one white because the cleaning uh, would be perfect. But you see all these residual uh, in this plot, these red residual, these are residual systematics and residual foregrounds that are uh, in, uh, in the data, left in the data. So the really the, 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 the task is to uh, construct more and more realistic simulation and uh, also improve the clean technique so that this plot become white. So these uh, uh, spider plots that I show you here was like uh, it's uh, in our paper we discuss how different techniques uh, uh, are good on uh, the, the cleaning more on the line of sight, cleaning the small scale, cleaning the large scales, and these type of things. And uh, so the, uh, there is a lot of comparison of various methods uh, if uh, people are interested. This is just an example of how different, for example, GMCA and PCA can be, uh, and why PCA cleans better some properties of the foreground than GMCA others. So we did all this type of, uh, of analysis. So the idea is to repeat this with a more complex simulation that uh, we are constructing, so there will be a, a second project uh, uh, starting from this. So um, I am almost done. So I just want to uh, give you an idea of how we want to move forward. So from one side, we have this, uh, this data uh, that we are keeping working on data. We're uh, very busy with that, uh, with the, this mere class data. Uh, and uh, we try to, uh, to really understand better the instrument, improve uh, the, the pipeline. So we have uh, a lot of new data that we are 
uh, analyzing. So this here was uh, from the 2019 data, but now we have uh, 41 blocks of observation always in L data uh, taken just last year that we are analyzing now. We also have UHF uh, data available. Uh, the UHF band is uh, uh, just uh, at lower frequency with respect to uh, the L band. Uh, so we can go at higher redshift with that. That would be really, really super, super important. Um, so at the other side, we want to really improve the simulation because we need simulation to understand the data. And of course, as I was saying before, the final aim is uh, uh, this uh, uh, 21 centimeter measurement of the 21 centimeter out of our spectrum. So just to conclude, I hope uh, uh, I convince you that uh, uh, even if 21 centimeter cosmology we still have to prove its full potential. It's really an incredible window in the evolution of the universe. And we are taking data in intensity mapping. Uh, there's not only MIRCLAS, of course, uh, I'm just a bit biased on that. There's uh, a lot of other experiments that are trying to measure uh, the 21 centimeter signal. Uh, there is detection in cross correlation. We have a detection, but also other experiments have detections. And this is very reassuring and it's really motivating for the future. Uh, there's a lot of new data that we have that we are trying to understand and uh, develop a better analysis pipeline. Uh, and of course, uh, we really need to improve our simulation. So all this will be really fundamental to prepare for when the SKA will be available uh, and how we can really propose this case for the SKA and use the SKA to, to really uh, improve our knowledge of the last case structure. And with this, I finish and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for this great talk. Uh, are there any questions? If questions, use the raise hand button or just unmute. Uh, okay. Well, people gathering their thoughts, I ask a quick question. On one of your last slides, you were comparing uh, the GM, CA, and PCA cleaning methods. Uh, and PCA seems to be working better than GMCA for almost everything except for this SLOS. Uh, could you briefly explain what what it is? Yeah, so so it's uh, uh, so we try to to visualize in uh, with different uh, uh, statistics uh, the the various uh, uh, points of the um, of the cleaning. So uh, it's uh, the on the line of sight. Uh, sometimes some methods are much more capable of uh, getting the right level of the signal and some methods are good for the shape of the signal but it's uh, a lot they, they it's too much uh, the signal so in this case what is happening is that uh, gmca uh, it's better to recover the mean value of the maps so the mean the mean value of the signal uh, but then lose a bit of power on how the signal is distributed on the sky, while PCA is very good uh, on uh, the shape of the signal, but then uh, it's always like a bit dimmer signal. So the, the, the conclusion for us was that you should never use just one cleaning methods, but you always compare various cleaning methods to see where they do agree so that you're sure that it's there and where they don't agree, try to understand in which direction you should improve. So yeah, this is a, a good question. So uh, the, the idea is that the to, sh to show the spider plot really to, 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 to give an idea of uh, how much you should use one method for something and one method for something else. Okay, what, what, what were the SLOS? Uh, so it's a, it's a, the, the mismatch between the line of sight power spectrum power uh, uh, with respect to where you want to go and, and where you are. So it's eating a sort of mean value. Uh, and so the PCA is, is a, a bit more wrong on what is the mean value of the maps on the line of sight. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, David? Thanks very much for the nice talk. This is going to be quite a technical question. I'm sorry in advance for anybody else that's listening. Could you, uh, so I think it's your next slide where you discuss the effect of the beam or? Ah, oh, uh, this one. This one, yes. Hmm. Um, I, I kind of want to talk about the SK survey strategy itself. So my understanding of the way that this, that the intensity mapping survey will be done by SK is, is in this sort of single dish mode rather than autocorrelation mm -hmm. function where all the dishes are not, it's not the, it's opposite to the interferometric mode. Mm -hmm. And in order to reduce the one over F noise, it would be a kind of constant scan. 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I can go back on this if you want. Yeah. Sorry. It's going to be very similar to this at the moment. This is our proposition. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that affect your ability to calibrate your, the issues that you're having with your beam then? If you're constantly <laughs> yeah. scanning and you don't have <laughs> exactly. like calibration sources. So, so, so the idea, so um, at the moment, what we are doing is, uh, so I think what we need is just a very good beam model. Because if you have a good beam model, then you can, uh, this operation of doing tracking, scanning, and tracking. So what we do is that we, do, we use the, this diode noise. So we use the tracking part to calibrate the diode noise, and then we use the diode noise uh, to calibrate the scan part. So the fact that you have two tracking is just out of, to be sure, to see if there are variation, uh, anything, just to see how stable is your, your calibration, right? So when you do this, uh, uh, extract the information to calibrate the diode noise, you use a beam, you, what you do, you take a, a, you track a source and you do pointing uh, on source, off source, on source, off source, on source, off source. And uh, the, uh, the way you use this information is super important to have a very good beam uh, to put in the modeling. So if you know very well the beam, then you can trust this type of calibration. The problem is that at the moment, the, the measurements of the beam that we have available, it's not super precise. And also it's only up to five degrees. So uh, we, we are trying to, to really uh, uh, convince uh, somebody to give us a better beam model, because if we want, of course, for uh, detection in cross-correlation is fine. But at a certain point, you will really need to have uh, a good uh, handling of the beam. So what this plot is showing, so the technique is exactly the same. I actually have a version of this plot where I actually simulate the scanning, the exact scanning on the sky. Um, and the, the point is that uh, what we have seen is that uh, it seems from the modeling of the beam that we have at, at, at up to now. So, for example, this ADOS measurement done with the, um, by some people in the in the in the, in, in the Mirkat uh, team, uh, it seems that the side lobe structures slightly varies as a function of frequency. So it's not only that you expect the standard lambda over d behavior, but this there is like a sort of uh, a wave. Uh, that um, change the, the the shape of the full width of maximum and the position of the cyclops. So if this is uh, true uh, for our type of simulation or of observation, this is tricky. But we, if we do good simulation, we can take this into account. And this is what this plot is showing: is that if you don't correct for it, you can get spurious peaks that comes from this frequency at which these uh, cyclops are moving. But there, there are methods. Uh, so we, we studied some method to, to, uh, uh, to take uh, a bit care of this. Uh, and, but my point was really, it's a new thing. We really need uh, to think about all the effects that could enter in our uh, uh, measurements. So, so this, it was more a point of this is one of the challenges that we have. And we need to think about all the challenge and try to, to overcome them before the SKA arrives or as, uh, in, together with the SKA. I have a, a quick follow-on question. So then on this slide, you say that point sources and synchrotron spatial structures coupled with the beam complicate the cleaning. So if you had a much more accurate point source map, for example, from exactly. a large area, continuum survey over the same. Exactly. I would love it. Yeah, I would <laughs> love it. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is this is why, so I, I didn't say it explicitly, but uh, the, what we have in the modeling at the moment, right, it's these things taken from Planck. But as soon as we can improve this modeling with the new measurement, also coming at the right frequencies uh, from, from SK precursor, from the SK itself, uh, we can uh, improve our simulation, our understanding of the things that are going on. And we can use also real data, maybe in cleaning directly. So really, uh, instead of modeling, using the data as the, uh, the template sub to subtract. Yeah, that's a very, I, um, I'm waiting for the point source. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Other questions? Uh, then I'll go again. Um, so you were uh, showing that you had all this, this 30 um, IC 
channels in the cross correlation. Um, but if if you're looking at cross correlations, do you? So this this is I guess I guess if you're interested in the auto power spectrum, do you probably need these thirty PCA uh, channels. You, you need um, it also in cross correlation. Okay. So the idea, yeah. So uh, the idea is always that uh, first you clean, and then you end up with something like that. Of course, there are technique uh, to tell you uh, when you should stop. Of course, is is I mean nothing is like for sure, but you can you can have techniques that tells you uh, where when to stop. Um, and so the this cross correlation detection uh, is is really done once you have cleaned. First you clean and then you cross correlate because if you cross correlate the synchrotron, you the, the there's too much information from the, the foregrounds to actually pick up the signal signal uh, uh, correlation and so to have a detection. So you need in any case to clean. It's just that this cleaning is not enough for an auto correlation detection, but is enough for a cross correlation detection. Okay. But for for this analysis, you. Uh... You didn't include any other um, known uh, contaminant maps from us. This is just in the simulations that you're considering. Yeah, that. exactly. So yes, yeah, we are still trying to to merge the two things, right? Because yeah. it's a uh, um, th this one. Let's say we we knew that this could work because it worked for GPT. So this mm -hmm. is really PCA analysis. Let's try to uh, go down with an uh, go up with the number of foreground and then find the sweet spot and then cross correlate with wiggle Z and see if we have a signal. And this is uh, what we have here. Okay. And then when you simulate, how do you simulate the RFI? So that that would introduce a signal that would not be as smooth as what you. Say so, so that again. How do I simulate what? Sorry. The, I, uh... the RFI. Ah, they are fine. So the the so we are trying different stuff. So the first thing that has been already tried in some papers uh, is that um, the, the the first thing you have to think about is that your these cleaning methods work on this uh, uh, correlation uh, frequency frequency correlation matrix. So if you take your data cube and you start chunking out stuff and like uh, taking out part of this uh, uh, of the of your data cube because RFI is saying to you so this one you cannot use this one you cannot use uh, then you can first thing you can try is that are you still uh, strong in doing this foreground cleaning when you are taking out uh, uh, channels because of RFI so this is the first uh, the first thing uh, the second thing uh, especially uh, Brandon uh, uh, Engelbert from South Africa from UWC is working on that maybe you have seen some talks on it so you want to simulate the the, the satellites contamination and see uh, for example uh, if you have uh, satellites in your map that you didn't really pick up with the RFI cleaning uh, how much this can be a problematic for uh, for your uh, for your data because it's a uh, it's gonna be uh, it's true that it changed with time it's gonna be like large scale signal that enters in your uh, in your maps um, so there is still a lot of work that we need to do but the, for the moment these are the um, the two main direction so try to so what we want to what we are trying to do at the moment is like look at the data look at what the um, rfi residuals look like in the data and try to reproduce this in simulation and see how much we can actually clean this type of stuff okay i guess we have time for one more question but uh one more question i don't see any more hands raised uh, so I guess we can uh, uh, finish the official part of the talk. So thanks again for, for this nice talk.